Welcome everybody to today's webinar. My name is Jill Browning and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar, Water on Wheels, Solving Complex Mine Water Issues with Mobile Water Treatment Solutions. Before we get into our presentation today, I do have just a couple housekeeping slides to go over. Um, first of all, hopefully you should be able to hear me speak at the moment. But I do want to just briefly mention that uh, should you have any difficulties with your audio today throughout the presentation, there are two different ways to connect to the audio. You can call in through a computer or through a phone line. And also due to the large number of attendees on today's presentation, we have muted everyone's lines, but no worries on that. Uh, you can still interact with our speaker. In terms of interacting with our speaker today, you can ask your questions via the questions panel anytime throughout the webinar. And at the end of the presentation, we do have time set aside uh, for a Q&A session. So please feel free to ask any questions that may come to mind throughout. And we'll try to get through as many of those questions um, at the end as time allows. Additionally, we have made available our collection of on-demand webinars that we've conducted over the last few years. You can access more than 60 on-demand webinars over at www.violiawatertech.com. So feel free to go over to uh, that web website and feel free to browse uh, the variety of different topics that are available. One other quick housekeeping note um, here is a PDF participation certificate will be made available to you at the conclusion of the webinar. Um, you should be receiving that uh, within 24 hours or so um, for that. So be on the lookout if that is something of interest for you. And finally, at the end of today's webinar, you will receive a uh, quick survey requesting feedback. Should take no more than a minute or so of your time. And for those of you who do complete that survey, you'll be entered into a drawing for a chance to win a $25 Amazon gift card. So if you would be so kind as to fill that out for us, uh, we do greatly appreciate it. Now, before we hop into the main part of our presentation today, um, if you are not familiar with Veolia Water Technologies, we are a leading water and wastewater technology provider and we offer our clients a variety of technologies, services, and project options. And we support clients in a variety of different markets as well uh, to help support their water and wastewater needs. So feel free to uh, learn more about us over at that www.violiawatertech.com. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's presentation. David Oliphant is Vice President of Heavy Industries for Veolia Water Technologies. He is the North American market lead for the mining sector and is part of the global account management team for Veolia's mining sector. David has uh, 30 years of water treatment experience with the last 20 years with Veolia. So with that, I'd like to now turn uh, the presentation over to David. All right, Jill, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to everybody that's attended today. We really do appreciate your time. We understand how busy everybody is. And uh, so again, thank you uh, for taking the time today to understand about what Veolia can do for wastewater applications in mining. So what we're gonna touch on today, why should you consider uh, mobile water treatment uh, for your mine water application? We're gonna to touch on the various technologies that we have within our fleet, look at some various applications. Gonna focus a lot of time uh, looking at case studies uh, that we've performed in the past here across North America. And then of course, saving some time for any questions uh, that you may have. And, and uh, I really do hope we're able to get to all the questions that we receive. So again, let's uh, get this started. So why should a mine consider mobile water treatment? We look at a few areas. Number one, with a lot of startups, we do see the opportunity for our clients to defer capital costs, shifting 
you know, some of the expenses to an OPEX versus a CAPEX uh, purchase. We also look at deployment flexibility, looking at areas where if you need to get something in quickly, um, you know, whether it be seasonal uh, for augmenting existing systems that are currently there, really that has a good play for, for getting a quick deployment or adding on to existing uh, treatment strategies that you currently have. Also regulatory requirements. When we look at regulatory requirements, looking at putting mobile systems on site today, doing some treatment, whether it be uh, dewatering of, of mine shafts, uh, dewater, dewatering of a historical mine workings. Um, this can help in regulatory requirements and speeding up because not only are you doing that dewatering, but you're also gaining a lot of data um, for regulators that they can review as you're continuing to do that treatment. And then also looking at de decommissioning and remediation. Certainly we see areas where uh, sites need to decommission end of mine life. We can pull mobile assets in and looking at doing, an, a, again, an augmented treatment for, for discharge to the environment. And also in remediation areas too, where we're also seeing clients go into abandoned properties that they're now looking to, to reopen based on current uh, market values of commodities. So that is something that's becoming quite uh, a trend as well. So looking at deferring capital costs, you know, really the big takeaway here is when you're doing a startup of a new property, we often see looking at going to an operational expense versus a capital expense. And this allows to pay by the month while you take your limited financial resources and focus on the infrastructure that's going to generate revenue. We all know when you're starting up a mine, it's, it is a cost out uh, activity for sure. A lot of infrastructure required to develop a mine. Um, this is one way to try and defer some of that capital costs that you need on a wastewater treatment plant versus uh, you know going with rentals. So it is one area that we definitely see a lot of activity starting with you know whether it be six months, one year, two years. This is something that we see on a very, very regular basis. Also looking at that, having a mobile system, you can have that in play right from through exploration activities, construction, and then going right up to startup of, of uh, your operations at your site, looking at areas where now you have a permanent plant installed. Once that has been commissioned, you can then pull the mobile assets out and then continue your operation with a permanent fixture. Looking at regulatory requirements, we did touch on that, you know, looking at really trying to help speed up the permitting process. You know, typically, depending on what jurisdiction you're in today, a lot of times a shovel cannot go into the ground until you have some sort of treatment process in place. This really can help, again, speed up that process versus waiting, you know, 12 to 14 months for a permanent application. You can bring mobile assets in very, very quickly, have those set up in a, in a very quick manner and start treating water. And again, allowing to you to, to do your approval process with your regulator, but also gaining a lot of uh, critical data as part of that permit submission. You know, looking at, we talked previously about executing mobile and permanent plants in parallel, again, helping to start up the operations of your facility when you're ready to go. It's also a great area, you know, having mobile assets is also a great way to, to uh, train and, and have your, under, your, your operator, sorry, totally understand your difficult to treat wastewater applications and looking at what they need to do, understanding the challenges and how they can optimize the system. So it really does give you that benefit as well. And we look at required quality and quantity. You know, we understand regulatory permits, volume of water to discharge, you know, in some cases you can ask for amendments and uh, if we can treat more water, move that off site, um, certainly can, can benefit our, our clients. But really looking at the volume, quantity, and also guaranteeing what we say we're going to do with regards to discharge. Looking at deployment flexibility, you know, supplementing, we talked about supplementing existing systems, looking at increasing capacity. We have many of those uh, currently ongoing right now. Uh, looking at remote site capability, we do have abilities with our digital platforms to look into, you know, what the system is doing. 
I talked about rapid deployment before, you know, looking at what it would take to put a permanent facility in versus going with mobile and allowing you to start up much more quickly. Uh, again, I mentioned on exploration, construction, and, and operations phases of a mine development. Again, a very, very good tool for, for this application. Also, what we see is seasonal runoffs, depending on what part of the continent or what part of the world you're in. Uh, myself, personally, being in Canada, we do see snow. Uh, we do get significant runoffs, and uh, you know that may be an area where you can augment your, your tailing impoundment area to help create more freeboard. Many, many examples of that. And then also I mentioned to our remote monitoring capabilities uh, with our digital platform Hubgrade, which again can help us work with our clients to uh, help optimize their system. Decommissioning, looking at uh, you know examples of, of environmental emergency, if there's been some sort of spill on site, you know we have the capability to bring those assets uh, on board rapidly. Um, also looking at redeploying of assets at, in different areas of the mine site. If you're looking at end of mine life, or if you've seen some changes in various water pools in, in different areas of the site, we're able to redeploy those assets and move those into various locations across your mine site. You know, I talk about light infrastructure approach. So when you're looking at a mobile application here, you know, it's much easier to demobilize um, a system if you do have a short mine life, um, put in temporary buildings, uh, you know, tamped gravel floors, and we'll show you some examples of that, that that's being done today. So again, a much easier demobilization at end of mine life versus having large, you know, uh, fixed infrastructure to remove at end of mine life. And then really looking at, you know, making changes or additions to a, 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 our, our equipment as well, you know, water qualities do change. So we have the ability, uh, the the ability, sorry, to uh, bring in various assets as water quality changes or remove assets as water quality changes. But I think we've got some great examples that we'll share with you today just on that. So what are Veolia's mobile water assets? Well, you know, we do look at different areas. You know, we do have three flexible services here, as I've mentioned on some examples here, emergency, planned, or multi-year. So looking at each one individually, you know, each, each application is dealt with on an individual basis. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about those uh, a little bit later on in the process, but sorry, in the uh, presentation. So one thing I did wanna mention though, when we look at these applications with mobile assets, they really are no different than if we were to look at this as a permanent installation. This is really not an exercise of brokering trailers, no, it's really looking at what is your inlet feed, what do you require going out, and then having Veolia look at that treatment solution. So when we mention about you know different assets that we have available, you'll see that we often have to add multiple steps to uh, to meet our our requirements that we're saying we're going to do, and more importantly for you meeting your regulatory requirements. So how do we do that? We look at bringing we have the capability of lab services. We have full lab. Um, we can take water into our lab. We certainly have a lot of internal experts within Veolia, uh, not just here in North America, but abroad, and, and really looking at what is the best solution for each application, and then standing behind that with a process guarantee. Again, seeing what we're going to do really does, and we don't take that uh, lightly. That is not a trivial exercise within Veolia, but it does give our clients peace of mind. So looking at the wide range of uh, technologies that we do have, I will, I will preface this is that in the mining space, we see a lot with our high rate clarification technology and disk filtration, uh, small footprint uh, technologies. However, we do also have uh, UF, RO, we have filtration trailers, DI, softening. We do really do have the full suite of technologies available to us. And again, in many applications you'll see that we're using different pieces of the puzzle to come up with our, our process solution. Some of the typical applications that we see here, heavy metals removal, TSS, ammonia, TDS, total dissolved solids, arsenic, selenium applications. The real takeaway here is, you know, these are typical areas that we see within the mining sector. 
But I must say that really the majority of the applications we see are discharged to the environment with uh, a focus on toxicity to aquatic life. We, we understand the, uh, you know, the tight regulations that our mining clients are under, and we really do help support them through those, those applications, whether it be through permitting support on technology process descriptions, um, footprints, layouts, hydraulic profiles, et cetera. But really at the end of the day, it really does come down to toxicity to aquatic life. So um, again, with our lab capabilities and our partners, um, we can support those efforts uh, you know, through those various stages of permitting. One of the technologies here is that we use quite extensively in our um, mining applications in wastewater. Is, is our high rate clarification technology called ActaFlow. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this today because uh, you know, we are, we are uh, pressed for time, but the big takeaway here is that you know, it's typically 1 20th the footprint of a conventional clarifier and treats water typically up to 20, uh, 40 times faster than uh, you would see with a conventional clarifier. We've got a lot of experience, a lot of applications knowledge. And I think that's the big takeaway here is applications knowledge in mine water applications. You know, you can see high rate clarifiers out in the field, but I think with the, the number of years that we've been applying this technology in mine water specific wastewater applications, we know the good, the bad and the ugly, and we're, we're very pleased to share that with our clients. But uh, really the, the removal effective, effectiveness of this technology is great. As you can see, performance up to 99%. Uh, removal of turbidity, TSS, and other associated pollutants. Um, it really does have a very short resonance time. Again, it's a ballasted flock clarifier, typically 12 to 15 minutes resonance time within the process, and able to handle a lot of uh, variation as it relates to inlet water quality and uh, hydraulic capacity as well. This is just a snapshot of our of our mobile active flow. Um, technology here, trailer mounted. Also, you see a picture of our uh, one of our mobile reactors. Uh, it, let's face it, in, in mine water applications, we typically do see uh, a lot of heavy metals removal. So we are doing pH uh, correction ahead of the active flow to help us precipitate those metals, sometimes two-stage applications as well. Again, depending on what metals we're going after and what pH we need to be on those on those different constituents. So, but very, very effective in grabbing very minute particles. Uh, and we've got some good examples of that later on in the case studies, but also very high flows, you know, a 53 foot trailer, you know, you're typically looking at in a metals precipitation application, I would say 4,500 cubic meters per day or 825 gallons per minute. If it's straight TSS, uh, you know, we can certainly push that up to 1,100 or more GPM or 6,000 cubic meters a day. And we talk about inf influent TSS levels up to 4,000. I can personally uh, attest to applications that we have where it's significantly higher than that. And if we're aware of that, we can make the engineering design changes within our mobile equipment to make sure we can handle those, those large uh, inf influxes of TSS. Also another big player within our, our, our flow sheet in the mine water, wastewater applications is our Hydrotech disc filters. Again, uh, very small footprint technology. Um, the one you see in the picture here can treat again up to around uh, 1100 GPM, uh, around 6,000 cubic meters a day. They marry very well with our mobile active flow units. Um, you know, they can do standalone applications as well. Uh, but very easy from an operational standpoint, does not require a lot of operator attention, uh, automatic backwash. So again, lends itself very well. And it really is kind of a belts and suspenders approach. Typically in most cases, the active flow is, is very effective in getting us to the regulatory requirements that we need. However, if you do see some upsets, um, the disc filter really is there as that, as that kind of stop gap measure um, in ensuring that we meet these low level criteria that we'll uh, talk about later on. Also, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, we do have a full fleet of, of uh, UF and RO systems. Uh, I can tell you, I know we're commissioning a, a wastewater application right now uh, at a, a mine site using these types of assets. 
Um, so really, again, the takeaway, looking at where we have the assets, what makes the most sense in each application, I think is one of the uh, uh, nice things that we have that Veolia can bring to each of our projects. Uh, but again, this is just to give a, a good flavor for everyone that we have full asset capability across the board. Okay, I'd like to jump into some case studies now. And again, you'll see here, I'll try and reflect back into some of the things that we've spoke about earlier and, and looking at these various case studies. Um, you will see that some of these are, uh, you know, uh, confidential clients, so we do not have the names. Um, but again, it's, it's real case studies that we've had here um, over the last several years um, and that we're very pleased to share with you. So looking at the first one, a palladium mine, we talk about emergency type applications. This is a perfect example. This client had a, uh, an issue with their impoundment, uh, tailings impoundment area over the winter. Um, they had to store a lot more water than they anticipated. They had a very large freshet uh, spring runoff uh, at the site. And there was concern that they were not gonna have enough freeboard uh, in their impoundment area. Here we were able to uh, dispatch uh, equipment very, very rapidly. Again, using our ActaFlow technology only. This was for aluminum removal. Um, however, they had such a very fine telky material in their source water that we didn't have to do any pH correction per se ahead of our ActaFlow. We were able to grab that aluminum out of the, out of the solution just based on the amount of TSS that was in that water. So uh, again, utilizing our, our lab capabilities, taking water into the lab, we identify the recipe we need, we get to site, we mobilize quickly, and we already have an idea of what the recipe is that we need to be able to start treating very, very quickly. Look at this is a, a confidential coal mine in Western Canada. Again, a very rapid mobilization. This was really to get to a, um, a resource uh, there was a large volume of water uh, that need to be removed prior to getting to the resource. Um, the big driver here was cobalt. And uh, what we were able to do there was mobilize all our equipment. It was around the uh, uh, 12,000, sorry, 10,000 cubic meter per day uh, treatment, uh, 1800 GPM. We had to be in and out within basically a three month window so they could start mining. Um, but you know, one of the takeaways here when I talk about the effectiveness of, of ActaFlow for the removal of metals, you look here, for example, you know, cobalt 4 ppb down to 0.1 ppb, copper 11 ppb down to 7.7 .7 ppb. So these are extremely low levels. They're already, relatively speaking, low level metal concentrations, but you can see how effectively we could take you know, this down. I should mention we did have disk filters on the back end of this plant just to get that final polish. Uh, but again, extremely low levels of metals in this specific application. We look at a planned application. Uh, this was a, uh, this was a, a, uh, uh, a nickel ore spill uh, that had sat in an area on a, actually it was a rail spill uh sat in the environment for many many years what had happened is this ore had you know basically created an acid mine drainage it had it had uh, affected local uh, surface water uh, and soil and veolia was able to come in working with our partners to uh, bring in mobile assets in a very very tight footprint i should mention it was an abandoned rail bed so not a lot of space uh, but again, treating water down to extremely low level metals. If you see some of the applications here, you look at uh, zinc, you know, basically going from, uh, you know, 960 ppb down to 3.5. Uh, copper looking at 120 ppb down to uh, uh, 1.2. Uh, aluminum, again, you see 970 micrograms down to 22. So again, the big takeaway here is looking at where we can take low level metals applications. We've got a lot of experience in dealing with these types of, uh, of low, low level metals applications, okay? This was a complete turnkey as well that we uh, uh, supplied all chemicals, um, operations, MOB, DMOB, 
And also we did have uh, remote monitoring on this plant as well. Next one here, one of our partners, Equinix Gold, the Greenstone Gold Mine. This was for the removal of TSS and metals. Uh, this was for a dewatering of a historical mine workings, uh, again, with process guarantee. Uh, this was a very interesting, and one of the things I just wanted to bring to your attention, if you look at the, uh, uh, when I talked earlier about um, light infrastructure, this is a great example. You can see it's a temporary building. You see some of the guards, you know, our wood guards, all done very, very professionally. But again, using the term light infrastructure, if you look at the floor as an example, it's not a concrete pad. It is a tamped gravel floor, again, as long as it's uh, level. So again, this is an area where a site can be mobilized very, very quickly. If you were to build this as a permanent facility, um, you know, you could be looking at 12, 14, 16 months. You know, here we're able to mobilize a plant, you know, within several weeks versus, you know, several months. So, uh, you know, that plant is now decommissioned and there is a permanent facility now um, treating uh, on a permanent basis. But you're also seeing a lot of variation in this feed water. And again, really looking at the equipment we have, it's really the building blocks. And then if we do see variations in, in, the, uh, in the feed water, I hear we've seen a lot more organics than we had seen when we were doing, doing sorry, uh, preliminary uh, testing in the lab. Uh, we're just able to change our, our chemistry versus having to change any equipment that's on site. And you can see here as a plan, this was a 14 month uh, operation. This is another gold mine. This is an interesting project because here it's a hybrid of having mobile equipment for the removal of TSS metals and arsenic. But then also we had uh, built a permanent moving bed bioreactor biological process for the removal of ammonia and other nitrifying contributors that we see often at gold mines, uh, thiocyanate, cyanite, cyanates, uh, and some other cyanide species. So again, combining a permanent facility with mobile assets um, to, uh, to meet the, the regulatory requirements of not just the ammonia levels, but also metals and TSS. Um, we are still operating at this site today um with these mobile assets and, and permanent assets okay this is uh so far has been a two-year operation uh, around a thousand gpm for treatment um and again we've seen a lot of changing water quality at this facility but being able to you know handle that through chemistry this is a nickel mine up in northern quebec uh, this was a, a, a rather unique application for me personally. Uh, I do remember this one from the standpoint of the removal of thiosalts, and, and it's something that I had not seen uh, in uh, a lot in, in my mine uh, water treatment experience. So this was a very interesting application. And I think one of the key drivers here was, you know, we know how to treat thiosalts, and we had some different options. But really, the takeaway on this was looking at where do we bring uh, assets in from? So looking at, you know, trying to bring, you would think that make the most sense to bring assets up through North America, which we did have. Um, however, based on the location of the mine site, when we talk about remote locations, you know, it made, it was actually more efficient to ship our mobile assets from Europe on uh, our client had a, a freighter that was going across the ocean. It was actually easier and quicker for us to ship from Europe to go to the mine site directly than trying to ship up through through North America. So uh, it was again, it was a, it's a, a, a remote site. Uh, it was a quick mobilization, and by working as we always do with our clients as a team, coming up with the best way to get assets there quickly. And uh, we had assets up there for a couple years. Uh, very, very effective. What we did here was we took one of our reverse osmosis trailers and we retrofit to uh, to nano uh, filtration membranes, and it was very, very effective in the removal of uh, a thiol salt. So uh, a, a great project and a great partner as well. This is the Bruce Jack mine in uh, northern British Columbia. 
a um, little joke internally and with our, our clients. Uh, and I think there may be one on the, on the meeting today. You know, we started out as uh, with our mobile assets there, uh, started out as TSS removal. Uh, then as the site developed, going through the various development phases, we then started looking at the removal of metals, uh, right to the end, uh, looking at the removal of nitrites. Uh, but again, the takeaway on that is having mobile assets there and being able to modularize your, your plant. So starting off with an asset, adding an asset, adding another asset, it was a great way to, to allow our client to, to meet their regulatory demands um, and also in a, in a timely manner as well. So uh, again, working very closely uh, with our friends at the mine site and uh, coordinating accordingly. And I, I will make a little joke here that we were calling that the Franken plant because it did have various various additions over the over the two years uh, that we were there. But again, uh, a successful project, and I'm very proud to say that we, uh, you know, worked with our client to uh, install a permanent facility that is still operating today. So uh, again, flexibility. I think looking at these multi-year type applications, uh, emergency or planned, you have the ability to be able to to uh, uh, remove, add, reconfigure assets as we see fit and as water quality uh, requires. This is a titanium mine in Quebec. Uh, right now, we're you know we've done a two-year treatment uh, application here. We've just extended for another three years. Um, so this is a great example of a long-term type application. It's for the removal of nickel. Um, and one of the interesting things here is that based on the uh, permit that our client had, they really asked us to to look at uh, using their their chemistry. Uh, that's currently on site and that was permitted. So here we're operating the facility without uh, a metallic uh, coagulant, uh, been able to uh, uh, treat there now for, like I said, over two years, uh, being a very successful project. But again, being able to take water into our lab, you know, before we can say, yes, we can do this, we have the ability to bring in the mine water, test it, based on the chemistry they have on site today and then verify and confirm and give our clients the confidence they need um, to allow this equipment to come on site. So again, uh, still operating today and uh, a very, very uh, interesting project. We're getting close here to the end, but this is another application. This is not so much a mine site, but maybe for mine derivatives. You know, this is a, a, a dredging application in a harbor here in Canada, in Ontario. Um, there was a large containment facility that was built in the middle of the harbor. This was, in, this was uh, dredging sediment that had been impacted by um, uh, coal gasification plants over the 100 years that had been dumped into this harbor, uh, steel making processes, et cetera. So a lot of industrial pollution. Uh, there, what we've done is uh, removed all metals, pHs, like you know, highly contaminated sediment, we're taking all the water off the uh, the containment facility and sending that back into the lake. The, the the message I want to leave here is that this is a what we would call a high volume type application. Um, these assets now are actually redeployed at a mine site uh, at a gold mine right now, um, probably due to come off site uh, near the end of August. But we do have that capability as well of looking at not just having you know, high rate clarifiers on wheels, uh, reactors, uh, UF, RO, DMIN, but also these large volume metals precipitation plants as well. This one's rated for say 20 to 24,000 cubic meters per day. The project that I'm referring to here, Randall Reef, 16,000 or 3,000 GPM, but we have the ability um, to push much more flow through that plant. So, you know, we do have those types of capabilities as well as part of our mobile fleet. Whoops, sorry. So just to wrap up, when is it to uh, a good advantage to rent versus buy? I think, you know, looking at it from an operational budget, you know, looking at just deferring, you know, minimal capital expenditure right out of the gate, uh, is, is one area that we see. It is a definite trend in the mining sector that we see today. Um, and, you know, our ask the, the, the demand on our assets is, is good proof of that. 
Um, also looking at, you know, looking at managing the short-term intermittent, intermittent needs through, uh, you know, the exploration, construction, and operational phases gives you a lot of flexibility. Also gives you a lot of data collection, understanding your water you need to treat, and then also looking at helping to shorten the, the time required for, for permitting. You know, regulators love to see, you know, show me the proof, show me this works. This is a great way to say, here's the proof we've been treating, you know, with this technology uh, and also helps permits, speed of permits, again, as they are very familiar with the technology. I mentioned before, it, the opportunity to train operators. It's great, you know, yes, we typically do operate these plants, but we often have, you know, um, client operators that will shadow our, our people. And I think we've got some great examples of that over the years. Um, looking at multi-year, you know, you can, if you have a short mine life application, maybe it makes sense to go with mobile assets versus building a permanent system that you need to demobilize. Again, if you look at short mine life, you get off site, maybe you redeploy those assets somewhere else at end of mine life, or they pulled completely off site. You have that flexibility. I think the big thing I wanted to end this presentation with is, you know, we look at these mobile asset applications just like we would with a permanent plant. So we're looking for data, raw water in, what do you need out? What's your permit allow you to discharge at? And then looking at what needs to be done and then how we configure that plant. It really is the same process that we would do for a permanent facility, but certainly done under a much quicker time frame than you would with a permanent plant. So uh, with that, I will end my presentation and ask Jill if we've seen any questions that have come through. Yeah, thank you very much for that very informative presentation, Dave. And I do have some questions that came in. And just to remind you as well, um, if you have any questions as well, feel free to type those over in the um, questions panel. So with that, we will kick off our Q&A um, area. Um, one question, Dave, that came in is, um, can TSS and heavy metals removal be done via, say, one through one typical unit, or do they need to have um, different equipment setups for each removal type? No, that, that, that's a great question, Jill. And the answer is that we can do that with a, a single unit. Um, TSS, we're going to grab uh, very effectively if we're looking at the Octaflow as an example. Um, we're going to grab that, that suspended solids component. And then we look at what metals uh, we need to remove. And I think I mentioned earlier, you know, do you go one phase or two phase? So the answer to the question is typically yes. We can do it all in one phase, uh, one act of flow. Of course, if it's TSS and metals, we will have a reactor there up front, uh, but a single act of flow. However, that's depending, you know, on that, that's looking at metals that we're precipitating at, say, nine, nine and a half, ten. Uh, if you're looking at some other metals such as moly or antimony uh, to that respect, then, you know, we may need to look at a, a, uh, a second stage, as we say internally, to to capture those metals. But I'd say 90% of the applications are done with a single single process train. Hope Great, that thanks. Um, another, yeah, another question uh, here that came in is, uh, does Veolia offer buyout options if the rental exceeds a certain time period, such as uh, one year? Yeah, that that's I get asked that question uh, on a on a regular basis, and unfortunately, we do not sell our wheeled assets. Um, certainly, if we look at going to a permanent application, you know, working hand in hand with our clients, we will take into consideration that you know you've been working with Veolia for a year and. And, and we can make uh, we can have some discussions from that standpoint, but typically we do not sell our our, our wheeled assets uh, uh, to the state. Okay, another one that we've got here is um, how do you decide what's the best technology for a specific application? I think really looking at Jill is really looking at what is, are the the effluent requirement regulations. You know, every jurisdiction is different. Uh, every site has its own challenges. Receiving bodies. Uh, you know, there's so many different things that go in. And and really, I think um, 
working hand in hand again with our clients, understanding the requirements, uh, what regulatory pressures they're under, and then looking at what makes the most sense. So we're able to model um, a lot of our solutions internally and then look at that as to what makes the most sense because you know you can look at clarification and filtration you can look at you can look at membrane applications ion exchange they're all great technologies but then you have to start looking at what do i start doing with you know what's my residuals management plan you know looking at uh for looking at membrane uh what do i do with the reject uh I act same, you know, so there's all those parameters that we want to uh, look at, but it really, I'd say the biggest driver is what is the effluent requirements you need to meet at your specific site that will drive us to the technology. Great. Um, another one that we've got here. So this is um, talking a little bit with um, permit levels and how they can change uh, sometimes. So um, if you do have a mobile unit um, on site, then how easy are they to modify to accommodate uh, stricter limits or say perhaps uh, new parameters of concern that come up? That, that's that's a great question and and we do see that and and again we can we can speak from experience you know so yeah we do see changing water and we do see where clients have had changing permit requirements as well typically typically the the building blocks that we'll have there on site for you know a typical metals and and tss arsenic whatever it may be removal application in many cases when the regulations change say they become more stringent nine times out of ten we can we can treat that by just changing our chemistry okay now that's not all the time and we've got good examples where okay now it's we're going from this ppb level to this ppb level now that's where then maybe jill we would have to bring in another asset say a polishing step uh whether that be you know we talked about disc filters uf ro we have that capability so you know the the answer is if we see changes you know because these are modular type systems um first step we look at is chemistry and then we'll look at do we need to bring in physical assets and if we do we can evaluate what is the best uh technology to bring forth to to uh to mitigate that new regulatory requirement Okay, um, I've got another one here um, regarding TSS and um, sometimes um, silt, and it's a question regarding how to remove silt. Well, you know, silt, and I, I'll tell you, we've got some plants uh, here in North America where we do see uh, silt as a as a, uh, uh, a treatment objective. Um, again, the Octaflow is is very effective in in uh, conglomerating solids, um, you know, depending on what the loading is. And, and I can tell you personally, I, I will say it publicly here on this call that, you know, I have installations where we've seen solids loading uh, examples, clients are mucking out underground. We see huge swings um, of, of TSS coming into the system. Um, the the as high as 9,000 and higher, 9,000 ppm and higher, uh, able to handle that through our active flow technology. Silts, you know, typically we see are are quite much lighter type TSS. And again, because the active flow, if we look at just the active flow clarifier as as a great example for treating silts, um, it's able to capture these light fines. Uh, conglomerate and drop them out because it is a ballasted clarifier. So we have that sand as the ballast that helps make a very dense flock. So um, again, if there's any questions, you know, we typically would take in that water into our lab, run that through the lab and really get a true picture of what the treatment efficiency is going to be through the through a technology such as ActaFlow or uh, a multi-flow type application. Great. Um, got quite a few questions coming in, so hopefully we'll be able to get through um, a lot of these. But um, another one is regarding um, high treatment rates. So what are the potential solutions for high treatment rates? And then does the high does a high high excuse me, 
does a high rate treatment system uh, respond well when the flow decreases significantly? Um, and then there's, for example, 3,000 gallons a minute uh, for one month and then three months, say, at 1,000 GPM. Yeah, that, that's another really good question. And I think that's another really good operational uh, advantage of, of a ballasted flock clarifier looking at, you know, the turn down ratio that we're having. You know, I can even turn that around and where I've got clients where it's turned around the other way, where they start at 1,000 you know, gallons per minute and they go, hey, you know, at the end of year one, I'm forecasting, I'm probably going to need, you know, up to 3000 GPM. So to answer the first question is really, yes, the turn down. So going from a thousand to, sorry, from 3000 down to a thousand, not a problem at all uh, in that technology. Um, and we've got numerous examples that we can share uh, on that respect. Uh, but again, also on the flip side of that is we're able to, within the same footprint, go from you know, low flow applications up to a higher flow and, and we can work with our clients and give them the exact, you know, based on their water quality uh, requirements, what their feed water is, we'll be able to give them a very good picture of the ranges that we can run that, that equipment in. So uh, I hope that uh, answered that question. Okay, another one that we've got here is, um, what's the standard lead time to mobilize? Is the uh, units to a site in North America? That's another very, very good question. So typically, um, if we have assets readily available in our in our yard, um, you know, I think I mentioned one. Uh, I presented one. Uh, uh, it was a palladium mine here in Canada. Um, there, I mean, I took a call on a Wednesday, and we had assets rolling down the road on a Saturday. Okay. Um, typically, I would say within a week you know, we can we can have assets ready to go. But again, uh, it could be if we're looking at UFRO, uh, DMIN, whatever it may be, you know, typically we can dispatch those those assets, uh, you know, almost immediately. So um, it really depends on the application, Jill, um, as to what, you know, we need to do. I, I will be very transparent on these wastewater applications for mining. They typically can be quite complex and not always just a single treatment step. So, you know, we may have to bring some items in specifically for that specific project, which can take some time. Getting the assets down the road, you know, usually within, you know, a, a few days, but then there may be some other items that we need to buy specifically for that project that, that can take a few more days. So, uh, but typically it's a pretty rapid deployment. And another one that we've got here as well, um, are process guarantees offered as part of the standard rental price? Yes, they are. And, and as I mentioned, you know, earlier, uh, you know, process guarantees are something that Veolia certainly prides themselves on. I said that we do not take those lightly. They're not trivial. So there's, it's, it's, we don't offer an extra charge to take a process guarantee. It's typically what we will do. However, we'll work very closely with you to, get, to make sure we all have a clear understanding of what the what the feed water is going to be. Uh, we have clear understanding on both sides as to what the effluent requirements are, and then we'll develop our process guarantee based on that. We'll work with our clients hand in hand. Everybody's clear as to what the requirements are of that process guarantee and then we'll we'll take it from there but uh you know each one is looked at individually and and uh again specific to each project great i've got a couple questions uh, that look like they came in somewhat uh, around the same topic so um talking about what to do with precipitated waste um and how you handle that yeah that's a good question so typically and i say typically we uh for for temporary applications for handling you know sludge off our pro let's let's talk about the octaflow process as an example typically in a mobile application we would first choice is looking at like a geo geotextile membrane as a, as an example you know it's it's relatively low cost um it's it's uh fairly easy to set up um, in many cases, you know, with with getting rid of the the, it's typically a metal hydroxide sludge that we're we're going to be dealing with in a mine wastewater application. 
in, in some cases, clients can uh, uh, dispose of those on site as a mine waste, again, depending on jurisdiction. But um, that would be our first choice, Jill. We have had others where, um, and I can think of our, um, our friends at, uh, at Bruce Jack were there. Um, they uh, had to, you know, we had to get that equipment at site there across a 12 kilometer glacier. Um, so for them getting solids, you know, hauling solids off site was not a trivial task. Um, there we actually used a centrifuge. And uh, I think if uh, uh, my friends from Bruce Jack are still on the call, I think, you know, we were getting, you know, uh, solids out of the centrifuge at around 45% which was great again, because it minimized the amount of water you're hauling you know, off site and paying for. So, so we have a few options there, but that's always a, a, a good uh, dis uh, discussion topic as to how we're gonna handle the sludge. Some will send it directly to tails, some can send it underground, some send it to pace backfill. I mean, the, the options are, are really very, very site specific. Great. Um, I think we've got enough time for maybe a couple more questions here. Um, do you have a Do you have a certain pollutants limit of receiving water? Pollutants limit, like a max of what I'm feeding to the plant. Pollutants. I believe that's uh, that's you just the repeat, question. Could you, yes. repeat the, could you repeat the question again, Joe? Uh, do you, sure. Sure. Do you have a certain pollutants limit of receiving wastewater? Well, you know, I guess every technology has its has its limits. Um, I mean, I, I, I can say that that the the receiving waters, you know, we can take a wide variability as with regards to metals, concentrations, um, uh, TSS loading, et cetera. Uh, really, you know, I don't want to say we can take everything because that, that wouldn't be a fair statement. But I think, you know, looking at each case individually, I can tell you, you know, I've seen uh, very, very high solids, high metals, et cetera. Um, but maybe we need to add something else downstream. Uh, it, it really depends. So that's a really hard question to answer. I think we, we look at each case individually and, you know, give a hard yes or hard no very, very quickly. And then if it's something that's kind of out of the norm, um, it would take a little bit more dialogue to see what we can do. Great. Um, question regarding uh, power consumption. Um, what's the typical power consumption for, say, 6,000 GPD, or maybe at a higher flow rate going up to as much as 30,000 GPD? Yeah. Well, that again, that's that's a good question and, and kind of hard to answer because it's really going to depend on, you know, what type of technology we're looking at for the specific application. You know, for example, if we're looking at, a you know, a membrane, uh, you know, type application, you know, we're looking at things like temperature, solids loading, what do we need as pretreatment, et cetera. You know, so would that be a little more power intensive? Yes. Um, if we look at our, our um, high rate clarification technologies that we have, very low power draw. I mean, you have basically a recirculation pump. You have some very low power mixers. Um, so, you know, from that standpoint, typically very, very low power draw. But what I would say if, 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 if whoever is asking the question, if they have a specific you know, application or, or requirement, we'd be pleased to look at it. We can, that's part of what we offer as a service. You know, when we're looking at the various uh, technologies is looking at power consumption, reagent consumptions, uh, and really give them a clear picture of what, what they can expect as operating cost, as well as, you know, what the, the typical rental cost would be. But really it's gonna depend on the application, Jill, and the technology that we bring to the, to the table. Great. Um, maybe one or two more questions that we've got time here for. Um, regarding planned treatment, um, how can a client reserve treatment equipment in the case of uh, limited equipment availability? What's the best practice for that, that? That is a very, very good question because, you know, again, in all transparency, that has been, and I think it's a market-wide um, uh, 
trend that we're seeing, you know, within Veolia and others um, is there is a large demand. Now on a planned application, you know, if, and, and I can think of some examples and a couple of them that I presented today, um, where we know far in advance um, that those are, are on their way, certainly giving, having the visibility, uh, the forward visibility to say, hey, I'm going to need something allows us to plan internally. But also as we bring more assets out into the marketplace, that's a great, that gives us a great window to say, Mr. Client, you're looking at something eight months from now, uh, 10 months from now, next year. Um, you know, it gives us a good window to plan and making sure that we have the assets available, uh, available, sorry. And also looking at, you know, retainers and such is another good way um, to, to, uh, to confirm that we will have equipment available. Okay, so, and we're doing that a lot right now to ensure our clients get the assets they require. You know, typically we take a, a, a retainer or down payment uh, as part of that commitment to ensure that we have those assets available. Great. Um, another question um, regarding the treatment of sulfates. Yes, the, the lovely sulfates that everybody loves so much. Um, typically, you know, on a mobile application, again, there's there's various ways that we can look at that. I think when we look at from a mobile standpoint, um, you know, can we look at a biological approach? Typically in mobile, not so good. Um, I would say looking at RO as, as an example, look at a membrane-based application for sulfate removal. But again, we really need to understand you know what the influent feed water is what the requirements are for effluent uh, uh, discharge and then look at you know what assets we could make available whether it be nano ro um, we would look at various options there because that is one certainly that we're seeing more and more of every day as well good question yeah i think we've got time for just one more question here um this one's regarding uh, government or ministry approval. Um, how easy is it to get ministry approval um, to set up these mobiles at at a site? Well, I tell you, I mean, it really, you know, looking at, um, you know, looking at various jurisdictions where we've done work with ActaFlow, whether it be, uh, I'm going to use that as my first example, uh, where we've done treatment with that technology. So, you know, looking at, you know, regulators going, oh, yes, I know you guys have at, at this at that site, that site, that site, you know, it's that comfort level. So I think that does help assist in, in pushing permits along. Um, I think also the support that we can give our clients, I want to be on the record, we do not do permitting. I'm not trying to, to take anything away from companies out there, consulting firms and such that do permitting. We would support those types of applications with, again, I think I'd mentioned in permitting support, process descriptions, uh, MSDS, uh, uh, layouts, hydraulic profiles, you know, kind of the supporting documents that would go into part of a permit. Um, typically, I think, again, depending on the jurisdiction, it can, it can go pretty quickly. I've seen times too where, you know, there's a pilot going on but also having the opportunity to try and discharge some of that water as long as it meets the regulatory requirements so that can help speed things along as well so um i think it really depends on the the, the jurisdiction that you're in and and what your regular your regulator requires great thanks so much david for all of that uh um, with that, uh, we are coming up right on our time. So um, with that, uh, I do want to thank everybody um, that has attended today. And I apologize if we did not get to uh, answer your question. If, if that's the case, uh, we will follow up uh, afterwards directly with you as well. And again, feel free to uh, email any questions over if you come up uh, come across anything um, in the future and would like a little bit more details on that as well feel free to um, send us an email and with that that will conclude our webinar today um, do thank everybody and we do ask uh, if you would be so kind to fill out that quick survey at the end um, it should pop up as soon as the webinar concludes 
uh, we do appreciate that. So with that, uh, that concludes our webinar today. Thank you, David. And thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Really appreciate it.